today's lecture is going to be about this third topic. In the last two lectures uh, we covered photolithography and then we covered a traditional machining for hard materials like silicon and glass. And today's lecture we're going to cover uh, soft lithography and micromolding. So these techniques are more applicable to soft materials and can even be used to pattern biological cells. By soft materials, I mean things like polymers and plastics. And we've mentioned last time that the reason you'd want to use plastics is just because they're cheaper. Those materials are cheaper to work with, cheaper to buy than uh, traditional microfabrication materials which are used to make electronic devices or microelectromechanical systems. All right, so let's just uh, jump ahead here. I actually bought a 3D printer in the lab, and unfortunately, it was it, it was quite a disappointment because I I bought one of the um, one of the early stage ones, and um, uh, they advertised it very well on the website. It was a company in in uh, 3D op. It, it's okay, but the thing is, it was quite unreliable. The nozzles were broke down. We can still use it, but it just tends to break down quite often. The newer models by uh, MakerBot. And 3D systems, those uh, those systems actually have uh, really nice um, nice features. They're more reliable. Yeah. So like a grand? A couple, I'm sorry. Those are about a couple grand. Yeah, a couple grand now. You can even buy uh, 3D printers for a few hundred dollars now. Enough of them are being made where they're they, they're being sold incredibly cheap. Everyone could have one in their home. That was the idea behind the industry. Uh, yeah, but the, some of the very the, the consumer grade, the few hundred dollars, it's not going to give you a very fine spatial resolution. But it's okay for printing, you know, if something breaks in your house and you want to print a 3D part to, to you know, um, to fix it, you can do that. The military did something like that over where basically they had a mobile parts hospital, they called it. Yes. And they could fabricate like a very small piece to go on with a, to replace something that broke on a dog gear or some other thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's that's interesting. That that was kind of the idea. Like, if you're in a if you're in a um, in a region where you can't get parts easily, just print the parts yourself. Pretty interesting. So we'll start off today's lecture by comparing uh, polymers and glass. Okay, glass is a traditional hard material that w we showed you can fabricate using some of the more traditional techniques like uh, wet etching, photolithography, and so on. Glass is also a traditional material in the sense that the chemists have used glass for years. And um, it's a very good material, but it's, it can be a little bit uh, expensive and more difficult to work with compared to polymers and plastics. So with polymers and plastics, we're going to talk about ways that we can use soft lithography to um, machine those types of materials. Uh, so before we do that, it's useful to sort of get a motivation for why we want to work with polymers compared to glass. So this um, slide from uh, a 2009 article uh, just talks about some of the advantages and disadvantages of the two materials. <clears throat> so let's take a look at uh, a few of these things here. Uh, so uh, the first thing, manufacturing costs. Okay, we sh we showed that with glass, you know, whether using powder blasting techniques or uh, wet etching techniques, a lot of them involve a photolithography step. The photolithography has to be done in the clean room, and so um, these processes typically have a higher cost. A glass chip will typically cost much more than a plastic chip. Uh, polymers, plastics. Uh, they have very low cost. Uh, you know that the plastic toys can be made for made for pennies using a technique called injection molding, which we'll talk about. Uh, in terms of fabrication complexity, uh, you know, you know, fabrication with polymers is typically simpler than glass. Uh, operational temperatures. This is uh, in, uh, an area where glass typically wins. Uh, polymers and plastics tend to melt at low temperatures. Glasses go up to several hundred degrees. So if you're working with high temperature applications, uh, glass is typically better. Uh, optical properties and fluorescence, uh, glass has superior properties in that sense. 
Uh, one of the problems with plastics and polymers is that they tend to autofluoresce. Fluorescence is when you um, excite a material with light and then it gives off, it just glows a certain color of light. Okay. It turns out that when you're doing biological assays, you, you don't want any kind of autofluorescence. You don't want the, the channel or the substrate material to fluoresce. You only want your biological material to fluoresce. All right. So uh, um, glass has very low autofluorescence, so that's a, that's a nice, uh, nice feature about that. It's also very optically transparent. You know, plastics aren't always completely transparent. They can appear kind of cloudy. So uh, uh, glass has, has a nice optical transparency. And uh, certain types of glass, like quartz, is uh, transparent even in the ultraviolet range. When we're doing biological assays, a lot of times we use ultraviolet light to, um, uh, uh, to stimulate fluorescence in biomolecules. Uh, with regards to bonding, so when we talk about bonding, we want, um, remember, we want a sealed microchannel, right? So we typically will make the channel structure in one, and then we'll have a flat cover slip on top, and we'll bond the two together to seal the channel. So with regards to bonding, there's a bunch of different bonding techniques available for polymers using adhesives, thermal fusion, ultrasonic welding, and so on. Uh, glass is a little bit more difficult to bond. You can still bond it using um, uh, fusion techniques, anodic bonding techniques where you apply voltage. Uh, I would say bonding with polymers is typically a little bit easier. Uh, surface treatments. With glass, there's very well-established surface treatment methods uh, based on organosilanes because chemists have been using glass for years. There are uh, surface treatments available for um, polymers as well. A little bit less established, but more and more surface treatments are coming out all the time. The reason we'd want to surface treat the material, why the surface properties are so very important, is because at the micro scale, uh, surface effects tend to dominate other types of effects, surface driven physics. So, for example, if we want to attach DNA molecules to the uh, to the surface. If we want to attach, if we want to cause cells to attach to the surface and grow there, we have to functionalize the surface. Meaning the surface has to have certain desirable properties. So we have to be able to treat the surface of of the types of uh, materials that we're working with. So we're comparing polymers and glass here because polymers and glass are the two most common materials used for uh, uh, biomedical MEMS materials for like things like microfluidic devices, and so on. Uh, the next thing is compatibility with organic uh, solvents or strong acids. Whenever we're doing chemistry, we, we want to have some type of resistance to acids or uh, solvents. Um, not necessarily, this is not needed for biological assays, because biological assays are always done in some type of saline solution, a physiological fluid, which is not really that harsh. But... Uh, um, if, if for some types of processing, we need to have we need to have uh, um, compatibility with, uh, with solvents and, and acids. So generally, polymers tend to be less compatible with uh, solvents and strong acids, and, and glass is, tends to be very good with it. Not all, but uh, it's resistant to many solvents and acids. A glass uh, polymers typically have low thermal conductivity, um, and glass. Uh, glass has a little bit better thermal conductivity, so it's less subject to heating. Uh, the next one is very important. It's uh, electroosmotic flow. If you want to do something called capillary electrophoresis, where you're separating molecules by size, you use a technique where you can pump fluids through a microfluidic channel using something called electroosmotic flow. Electroosmotic flow only works if the material has negatively or positively charged groups on the walls of the channel. Okay, so glass has this very nice property that when you expose, when you fill a glass channel with water, the surface of the glass is negatively charged. And that negative charge can be used to actually pump fluids through the channel using electric fields. That's called electroosmotic flow. We'll talk more about that later. So you get better electroosmotic flow in glass because it's very negatively charged. A geometric flexibility. And we'll talk about this in this chapter. Uh, there's a bunch of different types of polymer processing techniques which allows you to make uh, curved, uh, curved devices. It allows you to make three-dimensional devices. We talked about 3D printing, um, multi-height channels. And with glass, typically we're limited to 2.5D design. 
two and a half D means basically like what we showed earlier, where you have um, you know two dimensional structures that are extruded into the three dimension. So when we do a glass etching, we we have a two dimensional pattern on the surface, and then we drill down from that two dimensional pattern. All right, so an ex it's an extruded two dimensional pattern rather than than a true three dimensional pattern. The last point here is the permeability to gases. Um, can anyone, does anyone think why, why gas permeability will be important in, uh, in a biological assay? If you're culturing, if you're doing a cell culture in the microfluidic de device, why would gas permeability be important? That would be that would be an argument to not have gas permeable systems, but that, that's true. In some cases, we, we want to retain whatever the cell, whatever gases the cell is secreting. But the opposite is also true. Many times, if we have cells growing in a, inside a sealed microfluidic chamber, we want we want gases to be able to flow in freely in and out, like oxygen and carbon dioxide, because without those gases, cells can't live. So um, having gas permeable uh, devices is nice. So uh, a lot of plastics and um, a lot of plastics and elastomers, for example, are gas permeable. They'll allow liquid. They'll seal the liquid inside the channel, but they'll allow gases to freely flow through the channel walls. So polymers tend to have a high gas permeability, and glass typically does not. So, so there's some advantages to uh, polymers, obviously. Okay, so polymers and plastics, elastomers. How can we then uh, fabricate devices using these types of materials? The techniques that we use will differ depend depending on the type of uh, polymer or material that we have. Uh, there's three uh, categories that are shown here, which are quite common. Uh, one is the what's called the thermoset polymers. Okay, thermoset polymers are often um, often made using uh, injection molding. So, what differentiates a thermoset polymer is that uh, during cross-linking, the material during curing, the material is cross-linked and the structure is fixed. The curing can be thermal, chemical, or photochemical. So, examples of thermoset polymers are polyurethanes and epoxies. Now, if I can just uh, go back here and remind you that um, at the very abstract level, a polymer consists of a chain of uh, organic molecules. Okay, for example, a very common uh, type of chain is um, a carbon chain. The carbon atoms are bonded to other carbon atoms around it, and um, then then there are different side groups hanging off the end here of the carbon atoms. Now, um, I don't want to get into all the details of the chemistry because that's that's something that we could spend an entire semester talking about. Uh, the point I just want to make here is that polymers tend to often be long strings of molecules. That's why they're called polymers. Now, uh, this would be uh, what's what would be called a monomer, or one uh, one mo uh, one string of the polymer, and then in a solution you might have many of these uh, uh, chains like floating around. Okay, when when you cure the material, you actually form chemical bonds, which cause different side chains of the polymer to interact and bond with one another. So this molecule will then become attached to this one. Okay, so I'm describing this in very abstract terms, so I apologize if those of you who are chemists out there. Um, what happens is that the, the, when the monomers are separate in solution, or when, when these polymer chains are separated in solution, when they're not cross-linked, the, the material tends to be um, uh, flexible. It can even be in liquid form. 
All right, and when the polymer is cross-linked, those chains attach to each other, and then the material hardens. <clears throat> so getting back to this, the thermoset polymers is when the material is cross-linked by just applying heat to the system. Okay, uh, it can also be done with chemical or photochemical means. A uh, chemical example of a chemical curing would be uh, epoxies. Have any of you worked with two-part epoxies? It's a, you can buy a glue, and the glue has part A and part B. When you put part A and part B together, and you wait overnight, the glue cures and it hardens overnight. There's also ultraviolet curable glues. You know, you, you take the glue and you when you expose it to ultraviolet light, it hardens. Okay, th those are examples of polymers which are cured using chemical or photochemical means. There are polymers that you can also cure using heat. All right, but once the material is cross-linked, the structure is fixed at that point. That's one of the things that defines a thermoset polymer. Uh, thermoplastic polymers, uh, these polymers become soft uh, when heated above a glass transition temperature. So examples uh, include uh, polymethyl methacrylate, some types of polycarbonates, and, and polystyrene. So one of the features I would say about thermoplastic polymers is that they can be reversibly, um, you know, when you increase the temperature, you can soften the material and, and put it into sort of a liquid state. When you bring the temperature down, the process is reversible. So again, it hardens. So when we're working with thermoplastic polymers, something that we would, uh, you can do is just um, use an embossing technique, meaning you just heat the polymer up, it softens, and then you can imprint a pattern into that polymer and you let it cool down. That's called um, embossing or imprint lithography. Uh, injection molding we, we, we skipped over but I'll, I'll get to that in the next slide. So elastomeric polymers, uh, these are polymers that have uh, elasticity due to weakly linked, uh, weakly cross-linked side chains. So going back to this, um, this diagram here, when these side chains cross-link to each other, if those cross-links are very strong, the material is going to be hard. But if the cross-links are relatively weak, then these chains can actually slide up against one another, and the material becomes more flexible and rubbery. So that's what an elastomer is. And these classes of materials we're just bringing up um, because they're commonly used in microfluidic devices. With elastomeric polymers, you can use a technique called soft lithography to um, make microstructures out of those materials. Uh, so with the elastomers, I mentioned that the elasticity is due to weakly linked side chains, but these materials can be thermoset or thermoplastic, meaning they can either be cured using um, thermal chemical or photochemical means, that would be a thermoset, or um, they can also have thermoplastic properties as well. The thermoplastics ones, you can use these types of embossing techniques. So example, a common uh, thermoset elastomer is uh, polydimethylsiloxane PDMS. It's, a, uh, it's an optical elast uh, optically transparent elastomer, which is similar to bathroom caulk, you know, the stuff that seals your bathtubs. It's, yeah, but turns out it's, it's a very good material for uh, microfluidic devices. So the thermosets, uh, we can use techniques like injection molding. We can do um, uh, stereolithography, uh, as we talked about last time. Uh, what else? Um, we can also do like in situ polymerization. Okay, so there's many techniques we can use to work with these um, thermoplastics. Often we use some type of embossing technique. Hey, June, do you have a question? Oh, sorry, you're just you're just scratching your head. I'm sorry? That's one of the differentiating features between thermosets and thermoplastics. In a thermoset material, once it has been cured, then it's, it's difficult to melt it down again. It's difficult to reshape it. 
once you cure it, once those crosslinks form, the material is hardened. Okay. So, but you can still, you can take a thermal set material, and if you heat it up to a high enough temperature, then it'll start to, you know, other things may happen. You know, it could, it could still melt. You know, you, it could go under thermal, thermal decomposition. So it, it can be damaged by heat at certain temperatures. So the, the difference between the two is that in thermoplastics, the process is reversible. You can heat it up to a glass transition temperature. It softens, reshape it, and then bring it back down and, and let it harden. That's less, uh, that's less feasible with thermoset polymers. So since we'll start off by talking about um, injection molding. So the reason I'm starting off with this is because, uh, you know, before we, uh, we always start talking about microfabrication techniques, it's useful to know actually uh, what, you know, if you're fabricating a plastic part at the macro scale, a larger device, what techniques would you use? Injection molding is the technique that's used to make most plastic parts today. You know, like, uh, and it's used to make plastic parts very cheaply. And they cost like pennies. Uh, so, the folks in the in the microfabrication world have attempted to take this injection molding technique and miniaturize it. So, we'll start off by talking about micro injection molding. So, uh, micro injection molding allows uh, one to mass uh, manufacture polymer chips with very low cost. And, and most commercial microfluidic chips are, are in fact injection molded. So there are some commercial companies, we went over them on the uh, first day of class. The companies that sell plastic chips typically do make them from injection molding. Because when, um, when you have to mass manufacture something in the hundreds of thousands of parts, then injection molding is, is definitely the way to go. It's the cheapest way to make a part. When, when you have lower volumes, then uh, you may consider other techniques because uh, the, the cost of making the first device using injection molding is, high, is higher because you have to make something called a master. So let's, let's get into that. Um, so how does the technique work? This is a typical setup for uh, an injection molding system. So injection molding, you're, uh, you're putting in this uh, raw plastic material. Again, that raw plastic material is melted. And that melted material is goes through this screw system. The screw system is basically a pump. Okay, it's serving to push this melted plastic material into this chamber. This chamber has a mold in it. Okay, so the molded part is here on the left. So the mold would be some type of like a metal piece of metal, for example, that has a shape on it. And the plastic will be, the melted plastic will be flowed over that mold and will take the shape of the mold. So the mold is reused. Once you make the mold, you can reuse it and the cost of making the part is very cheap. But you do have to make that mold, so that's the expensive part. And then you also have to tool the injection molding machine. So uh, this is, the plastic can often be a very viscous material. So in order to get the plastic into this small crevice, the, the system has to be at a high pressure. You're, push, you're pushing the fluid, the plastic through at a high pressure. So you need to have like a robust uh, assembly to do injection molding. Uh, but the basic idea is that you have uh, um, you have a uh, sort of a clamp a clamp device here, and then uh, you can flow the plastic in the clamp. Uh, clamps down on the uh, on the part so that the the plastic takes the shape of the mold, and then you allow the system to cool. The process cycle looks like this: you clamp the two halves of the mold assembly together, uh, you inject the plastic material, and when you inject the plastic material, uh, the the parameters are typically the the shot volume, like how much plastic you're putting in there, how much pressure uh, you're injecting it with, and how much power. You let the part in the mold cool, and then you eject the part from the mold. So this process cycle can take anywhere from two seconds to two minutes per part, depending on how complex the part is, depending on how large the part is. But it can be done serially, and it can be done, you know, a lot. Uh, you can have multiple machines running in parallel. So this is a very manufacturable uh, 
uh, process. It, uh, when it's done at large scales, it's, it's actually much uh, uh, cheaper than glass uh, fabrication. You can get features down to the submicron size, amazingly. People have shown that you can get very, very small features. Uh, but it requires high injection pressure and speeds to ensure the filling of the small cavities. So when we're talking about the scaling of forces, remember, at the micro scale, we were saying that um, the smaller you make your fluidic channel, the amount of pressure needed to drive that fluidic channel goes up. Okay. The, the hydraulic resistance goes up by a factor of the di diameter to the fourth power. All right. So when you make these ver um, in microscale devices, when you have these very, very small cavities and very, very small features, you're going to need very high pressures to push liquid into those areas. So it's micro, uh, uh, micro injection molding is typically more difficult than standard injection molding when you're working with larger parts. The mold insert also has to be able to be hard and, and relatively durable because it has to withstand a high pressure. And smaller molds, like smaller freestanding parts, thin parts, typically are less durable and they can bend, they can under pressure. All right? So that's something that has to be considered. Uh, and to make the mold inserts, you often have to use some uh, microfabrication techniques to do that. All right, so this brings up sort of a paradox, right? This is what uh, um, many folks will, will wonder, like what, if we have to microfabricate a mold for this device, then how is it a cheap process? The, the, the fact that the, the process is inexpensive is because you can reuse that mold once you make it. It might be expensive to make that metal mold, but once you have it, you can just, um, you can keep on injecting, injection molding parts into that. And so the, uh, the process becomes cheap that way. Uh, okay, so the mold, there we go. The mold inserts can be made with micro milling, UV Liga, and electro discharge machining. We're not going to go into all those techniques right now, just for the interest of time. A couple examples of things that have been made. A lot of optics companies have made uh, gratings and waveguides out of out of plastics. Gratings have like certain surface patterns that reflect light in certain ways. Um, you can make spectrometers out of that. You can make light, light guides used for optical applications. Um, in the MEMS area, you can make micro springs and switches. Bio MEMS, people have used them to make micro channels, pumps, reaction vessels, and various types of mixing structures. This is an example of uh, a, a milled mold insert. So before you even get into this injection process, you, the first thing you have to do is make a mold. That mold will represent what type, the shape of the part that you want to make. One way you can make molds is by uh, a CNC milling them. And CNC stands for Computer Numerical Control. It's basically a little drill that's controlled by a computer, and the, the, the drill kind of goes back and forth in, in a three-dimensional pattern. And it, and it shapes uh, the, the mold, or the, shapes this metal part that you see here. Okay, So uh, this is a, a popular and easy way to make molds if you have access to a CNC machine. Some desk, you can actually buy desktop CNC machines anywhere between $10,000 and $50,000 now. Uh, but like an industrial scale one will cost, it could cost several hundred thousand dollars. So CNC milling and basically involves drilling, right? Physical drilling. You have a drill bit. So obviously the, the feature sizes and the resolution that you're going to get from CNC milling is not that great. Um, the feature density is about 200 micron minimum spacing between channels. Right? So if you were to make a microfluidic channel, you have to define these features on your mold. And the spacing between those features will, will determine the spacing between channels. So that's a minimum uh, spacing between channels is about 200 microns. The minimum feature size is about 50 microns. And the minimum feature depth is about uh, 5 microns. This all has to do with how the drill is actually cutting out, uh, cutting out spaces in the metal. This is a, an example of what a metal mold may look like. Um, 
So you can get uh, nice aspect ratios like this and uh, reasonably defined structures. You know, this was 200 microns, 400 microns tall, 100 microns wide. You can also see that there's quite a bit of um, surface roughness. Okay, when we want really smooth channels, like if we use something like uh, wet etching, uh, HF acid etching for glass, we get really smooth sidewalls, right? When we're using a drilling process like this to make the mold, the surface is going to end up being a little rough. It really depends on what type of application you're going to be uh, doing. The maximum feature size, uh, feature width here is a you know four four millimeters. Uh, you know a few more specifications here. You know um, aspect ratio is up to two, uh, radiuses of curvature, and you can see the surface roughness here. All right, these are examples from uh, a company in Europe called Microfluidic Chip Shop. They're a company that will actually, um, if you tell them a design of a microfluidic channel you want, if you send them a CAD design, they will make the part for you and ship it back to you. There are a lot of foundry services like this popping up, but the, the microfluidic chip shop is one of the uh, better known ones in Europe right now. So in addition to CNC defined mill inserts, you can also use photolithography and traditional micromachining techniques to make that metal mold. If you use uh, lithographically defined molds, they, you can get much smaller feature sizes. So whereas the, uh, um, the CNC milling could get 50 micron si uh, minimum feature size and 200 micron spacing between channels, with, um, with lithographically defined mold inserts, you can get about a factor of 10 better, actually a factor of 20 better. And the minimum feature size here is about 100 microns. And you can still maintain a large height. So you can maintain a large aspect ratio. So how does a lithographically defined mold inserts work? Well, um, remember, we have to, if we want to use photolithography to define a pattern, the techniques that I showed you in last lecture was just how to make structures out of photoresist, right? We can use, you can develop a layer of photoresist and make a pattern on photoresist. Then we talked about micromachining. If you have a layer of metal or a layer of glass underneath that photoresist, you can transfer that pattern to the layer below it. Right? But those weren't very deep structures. If you want to make a, a, a mold for, um, if you want to make a, a mold for doing these types of uh, processes, uh, then if you like injection molding, and, or if you want to do um, imprint lithography, you need to have taller features. Uh, you can use a technique called Liga and another one called um, uh, Demo to, to do this. Uh, I, I guess I'll just touch on these different techniques. Liga is a way to um, uh, form metal structures on a substrate. The process is... Uh, the process is, is relatively straightforward, but it requires expensive equipment. Um, you start off with a substrate, then you deposit photoresist on here, and you pattern that photoresist. Okay. The difference between Liga and standard photolithography is that this photoresist layer is actually quite thick. It's 100 micrometers thick, whereas with traditional photolithography, it's only a few micrometers thick. You know, less than 10, usually. But it's directly on the metal This is done on uh, a sheet of metal. So this is done on a metal sheet. Yeah. Now, if you want to get high aspect ratio structures and you're dealing with very thick photoresists, you, you can't use traditional optical lithography. Instead of using ultraviolet light, which is used in traditional optical lithography, you use x-rays. X-rays, as you know, they're just, it's just a, another form of light, but it's high energy light. Very low wavelength, high energy light. It turns out that high energy photons, uh, they don't diffract as much. They just go straight into the material. So if we have if we had a mask defined here and we wanted to expose this region of the photoresist, those x-rays would go into, um, they'd go straight down, the collimated beam would come straight down into the photoresist. They wouldn't bend and diffract off, which is what limits the aspect ratio of traditional optical lithography. So x-ray lithography is great in that sense. You can make very tall, high aspect ratio structures, but um, it's very expensive because you need an x-ray generator as opposed to just a standard ultraviolet light source.
so you use the x-ray source to um, uh, expose your photoresist. Then you electroplate nickel in here. Electroplating is where you put a voltage on, on you, put, you put it in a bath, okay, an electroplating bath, and then you just put a voltage on this side and you put the other volt side um, uh, in the solution. You keep the solution at ground and you apply voltage to this uh, nickel sheet here. And um, I, metal ions from the solution actually electrodeposit into this region here. And then you remove the photoresist, you're left with this. So that's a process called electroplating. Uh, an, another way you can do it is by using this approach, which is also involves electroplating some nickel. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to go into the, all the details of this process, just in the interest of time. But the idea is the same. You end up with uh, a structure, a metal structure, with protruding metal structures on top. Okay, this is what defines where your channel will be. Right, this is the mold that's ultimately used in your injection molding machine. So these molds can be expensive to make if you want to lithographically define them. You can get very small feature sizes. That's nice. They are expensive. But uh, once you have the mold, you can reuse it. And you can make many parts out of it. So that brings the cost of the, the final fabricated part, brings that down significantly. Let's go back here. This is an example of a plastic injection molded chip. Um, that has integrated fluidic connectors and can uh, it seals up to 10 megapascals, which is which is decent. It's pretty good. So moving on to the second technique here. So this was uh, injection molding we talked about, and we can talk about hot embossing right now. Uh, this one's an easy one to understand just because it's a um, it, it's pretty intuitive. You heat up the plastic, it softens, and then you imprint a pattern into it. That's pretty much it. So the, uh, this is done in the macro scale world. It's called embossing, hot embossing. And in the micro scale world, it's called nano imprint lithography. In, in the nano imprint lithography, you'd take a hard mold, something like silicon nitride or micro machine silicon. You heat it up, and then you push it down into a soft material. The soft material would be like a thermo, um, uh, 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 this, this type of plastic here, thermoplastic. And when you push that mold down, the plastic will then uh, deform. It'll take on, and when you let the system cool down and you remove the mold, you're left with an imprinted pattern. All right, this is a good review paper on this if you're interested in, in nano imprint lithography. Um, this is what the, the system, what the patterns may look like. Amazingly, you can get very tiny features using this technique. There's no optics involved in here. It's just pressing down a mold against, um, against the substrate. So there's no rally diffraction limits. Um, it's, pure, it's a purely mechanical process. And it's incredibly it's, uh, simple in concept. Um, it hasn't taken off. Well, it's, there are nano imprint lithography machines out in many clean rooms, but I would say, in terms of a, as a, um, it hasn't taken on, taken off to the extent that uh, that was initially thought. That being said, you can still make a lot of very nice features of it. This is an example of a grating. A grating is a series of um, repeating line patterns in a plastic. And those gratings can reflect light in specific ways. That's used for optics type experiments. Uh, you can make things like photonic crystals, also used for optics. You can make nanoscale channels. I mean, it's there's a lot you can do with <clears throat> there's a lot you can do with these types of uh, uh, things here. The the feature size here, um, you can see this is about a 500 nanometer scale bar. So the size of each one of these. Uh, um, I, uh, lines here is about 200 nanometers. Really, really small. And in this case, it's even smaller. Okay, so now let's get into um, PDMS uh, soft lithography, or what's called replica molding.
So we're talking about this uh, third technique now. So PDMS is an elastomeric material. It's, it's similar to bathroom caulk. It seals water very well. It's inexpensive. It's optically transparent. And it's, uh, people have been using it for um, biological assays for, I would say, since the mid, uh, late 90s, early 2000s. So the way that you can uh, micropattern uh, polydimethylsiloxane, PDMS, is by using a technique called replica molding. Now, a PDMS is a thermoset elastomer. So when you, um, when you heat it up, it cures, it solidifies. It doesn't, it doesn't harden into like a, uh, like a plastic, a hard plastic. It hardens into like a rubber. It's an optically transparent rubber, essentially. So this consists of uh, four steps. And uh, this is the process that hopefully you saw in the, uh, um, the week I was away in, the, in our lab. This is the, you guys saw the replica molding process. Okay, and, and we use this technique all the time. The labs, microfluidics labs always use this technique to make their devices. The first step is photolithography. Now, um, this gray region that you see here, this would be a, a material, for example, like SU8. It's a, it's a photoresist material that is optically defined. After you develop it, certain regions of the photoresist are washed away in the developer. So you have this uh, patterned photoresist layer. Now, um, you guys did not see how the mold was made in, uh, when you guys came to the lab. The, the, our mold was actually made in the clean room, in the microfabrication facility. So this is the, if, if there's an expensive part of the process, it's this part of the process, the photo, photolithography part. But the same thing as injection molding, once you have this mold, you can reuse it and make as many uh, devices as you need to until the mold like degrades and you can't use it anymore. The second step, we have this mold. We pour the uh, polymer precursor uh, onto the mold. Okay. Now, did you guys have a chance to, to actually do this, or did you just watch? You, you just had a chance to watch it, right? So, okay, that's, that's fine, too. So PDMS comes in a, a liquid form. There's two parts to it. There's a part A and a part B. And part A is the, um, uh, the PDMS material. Part B is a curing agent. When you mix the two together and you heat it up, the material cures. So what we do is we mix the precursors, part A and part B, and we pour that over the mold. It takes the shape of the mold. And then we put, the, uh, uh, we put this in a vacuum furnace. The furnace heats it up. We leave it overnight. We allow the PDMS to cure. The reason why you need a vacuum furnace is because uh, you, you may or may not have noticed this, but there were bubbles in the uh, uh, PDMS, when you uh, when you pour that material over the mold, any liquid material can have bubbles in it, right? So uh, if you have bubbles in it, those bubbles will eventually get, you know, solidified. Not solidified, but it'll they'll be encapsulated inside your microfluidic channel, right? So that's that's not a good thing. So having it in a vacuum furnace actually degasses it, pulls out all the bubbles from the solution, from the PDMS. So after a few hours in the vacuum furnace, the PDMS cures, it hardens, or hardens, or be becomes a rubber, essentially. And then you can just peel it off. So uh, this has a, a bunch of relief features on the top. And then uh, if we flip this upside down, we can uh, uh, bond it to a piece of glass which is shown in brown here, or we could bond it to another layer of a PDMS. Okay. This uh, second layer here serves as a sealing layer. This defines a surface pattern, so you can define a microfluidic channel on the surface here. But in order to seal the channel, you have to bond, you have to, you have, to have a cover slip, you have to cover the top. 
and then you bond it to that a second second piece of PDMS. So the reason why this process has become so popular is because the, the chemistry associated with it is, is well understood. The bonding is well understood and it's very easy to do. Uh, PDMS, if you take two pieces of PDMS to, um, and you, um, uh, you treat each one of the surfaces with something called an oxygen, uh, uh, oxygen plasma, or you can do a corona treatment on them, where you basically, like, um, corona treatment is uh, where you, uh, you have an ionized gas that treats the surface of the PDMS. It sounds complicated, but it's actually very simple. You can, you can plug a corona, uh, a corona discharge machine into the wall. They're about, like, this big, and you just run it over the surface. And I think some of you may, hopefully, you saw that in the lab. There's one in the lab. Okay. So when you put that corona uh, surface treatment on there, it creates these silanol groups in the PDMS. And those silanol groups can bond to, um, bond to other silanol groups. Um, so when you take those two pieces of PDMS that have been surface treated, you, you push them together, uh, they will form a bond with each other. And they'll form a nice seal. So it's a very simple technique because all you need is that corona is a treatment device. It costs a few hundred dollars. Compare that to if you wanted to have a sealed glass channel. And to have a sealed glass channel, you have to have, fu have a fusion bonding device, which will heat up the glass to temperatures ab above 600 Celsius. Or if you use anodic bonding, you have to apply several hundred volts or several thousand volts between the two devices as two sides of the chip as they're pressed together. So those processes can be more complicated compared to the PDMS process. This is, and researchers like to do the easiest thing possible to get to where they're going. You know, so that's why a lot of us uh, uh, use PDMS for our work. Can you, can you show us where you basically when you're actually running the fluid filter, you just kind of put like a needle in there almost? Well, one of the things you had shown was like the lube filter connector is something else. That a lure, a lure, lure, lure connector. Lure. So yes, yes. Do you have more issues where you're sealing it, like with actually introducing the fluid into the relative, relative device, or is that not really an issue? Oh, yeah, yeah. The, let me show you the, I don't think we have a separate slide on that. So, yeah, it looks like I don't. Okay. So let me just draw a quick diagram to show uh, show you. Uh, <laughs> so in the first step, uh, you made the mold. I, I'll just draw it from the beginning, you know, and just be simple, you know, straightforward. So you have a substrate, and then you um, then you coat it with uh, SU8. Let's say this is where your channel is going to go. Let's make this larger. This is where you want to define your microfluidic channel. Remember, this would be defined in in three dimensions. Then you're also going to have some inlet ports here, like this. Again, your substrate would look like this. So I'm going to try to draw this in three dimensions. So you're going to have, um, after you're, uh, you photolithograph photolithographically define your SU8 layer, you're going to have a mold that looks something like this. This is the part that's made inside the, and made in the cleaner. And it's just a one-step photolithography process. So this green material is, uh, we use something called SU8. So I'm just going to walk you through the process as well as the connector connection part that you were talking about. <coughs> so... Uh, in the cross-section, if we just take a cross-section of this device, we just have 
the SU8 layer, and then we have the um, substrate underneath it, which is just holding it. We pour the, uh, I'll put the PDMS in blue, so we pour the PDMS over this. So this is the PDMS layer. We pour it over the uh, SU8 layer and we just let it harden. All right, so afterwards you're left with this PDMS layer that looks like this. You can peel it off the mold. Uh, then you will, uh, then what we do is we drill holes through here. So we can just take a small drill bit and then just push it through this region here. So then we end up getting a hole in the PDMS that looks like this. Go like this. These are our access holes so that we can um, connect. Uh, connect tubing to it. We bond this to another uh, piece of PDMS, flat piece. Okay, and this part here becomes our sealed channel. So from here we can, inside these little access holes, we can connect the tubing. to drive, uh, drive liquid into the channel and to, the other tube would probably be waste in this case. So these circular regions that I showed you earlier, this is, these are the regions where the access holes will be. Uh, so these regions of the PDMS, you can't see the circular regions in this cross section, but basically like these are the regions where you can, you can drill down into, into there and make an access hole. Did that answer your question? Oh, it's a very good question. Yeah, the, if you get very high pressures, do you get leaking? Yeah, uh, there's. Uh, I can refer you to a paper on this. I, I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but um, this seal that PDMS forms with another piece of PDMS, it's a good seal. It's not perfect though. If you go to very high pressures, it this it will start to leak. You know, the this PDMS layers will delaminate from one another. So I know you can't go to like several thousand PSI. You may be able to go to, um, I've seen at most like 100 PSI. It depends on the quality of the bond that's formed here. I think on like the slide back, the graphic, you find in the other things, they have like it said, integrated fluid injectors, high pressure seals. Yes, yes, that's a, that's a very good point. You know. Uh, last time in class, we were talking about microfluidic chips, 3D printed chips with integrated fluidic connectors. Now, when you have integrated fluidic connectors, you can tolerate much higher pressures. Because when, um, when you make uh, just a chip prototype using PDMS, uh, you know, you have your tubing, you just get by plastic tubing and you insert it into this region. So you can get leaking from there. Because literally, you're, you're just, it's all, uh, this seal here is just a friction seal. Then you can also have leaking from here because this bond is not, it's not perfect. Right, so when you, one of the downsides, I would say, you brought up a good point that, that PDMS is, uh, um, it's not good for high pressure applications. For high, high pressure applications, you'll want to use, um, you can use materials like glass, uh, if you have like good fluidic connectors on them. With very high pressure applications, you typically have to use the three-dimensionally defined microfluidic parts that have integrated connectors. All right. Uh, there's quite a bit of material I'd like to get through, and I would like to finish this up today. So let's, um, we'll pick up the pace a little bit here. Uh, these are some PDMS structures that were uh, <clears throat> that were formed using um, uh, a soft lithography. This is that photoresist material. This is that SU8 material I was showing you in the drawing. Uh, 
this is what you define lithographically using um, you know, photo, traditional photolithography. When you pour the PDMS over this, it's going to take the negative of whatever the photoresist pattern was. So you get a negative replica like this. That's why it's called replica molding. And you can see you can get nice structures like this in, in PDMS. This is 30 micron scale bar. If you try to make your PDMS uh, structures too tall and too thin, then uh, you know then these structures will tend to bend. They'll collapse. So obviously you don't want to do that. And if your channel is too wide, this effect can happen too. So let's say you want to define uh, you want to define a a very wide channel like this. So you would create a PDMS structure that looks like this, and when you bond it to the substrate, you'd have a sealed channel. But if this is too wide, uh, any pressure on the PDMS can cause the whole thing to sag and then close off your channel. So PDMS being a flexible material, um, there's some downsides to that. Right, a perfectly rigid material, you wouldn't have to worry about these types of issues like lateral collapse and sagging. Uh, this chart goes over some of the properties of PDMS. It's, it's an inexpensive material. It's quite elastic and soft, being an elastomer. It has optical properties that are suitable for microscopy. It's uh, generally transparent, as I mentioned, and it has low autofluorescence. The surface is hydrophobic, but treating it with O2 plasma creates uh, reactive hydroxyl groups, which make the surface temporarily hydrophilic. Uh, this is useful for bonding PDMS. So when we treat the PDMS with that corona treatment, we're you know, essentially doing the same thing as, as an O2, a proper O2 plasma treatment. This uh, oxygen plasma treatment would be done in, in, a, in a vacuum chamber with an oxygen plasma machine. But we can approximate that with the corona bonder. Uh, it's generally inert and biocompatible, but it can swell when expo it's exposed to some acids. Um, it can self-seal by conformal contact. In principle, if you take a piece of PDMS and you push it up against another piece of PDMS or a piece of glass, it forms, it forms a seal. It's just not a very good seal. The bond can be strengthened with a corona treatment. So I mentioned it, it's, it has a high permeability to gases and fluids, which is good for cell culture. Um, there are two types that are available. We don't need to go into the details of this uh, right now. But this is what the material looks like. Um, it's, it's a... It's become a very popular material for um, uh, microfluidic devices. So uh, this talks about PDMS soft lithography. Mm. Micromolding is only one of the techniques that you can uh, um, you can use with PDMS. There are other techniques you can do as well. Uh, micro stamping. We'll talk more about this in the next module. This is for basically inking materials to a substrate. You can also do something similar with microfluidic patterning where you have a channel that's attached to a substrate. You fill the microchannels with some type of liquid, and then you remove the top, and you're left with these patterns here. All right, this slide compares traditional photolithography with these soft lithography processes. Now, this is where you might want to use these. Suppose you want to pattern um, some proteins. Okay, you want to deposit some proteins on a slide. And you want to deposit those proteins in a patterned manner. Doing that with photolithography, photolithography would be very difficult because photolithography involves photoresists. And you have to develop the photoresist. And then you have to strip the photoresist afterwards. They all involve strong acids and strong, um, or solvents, strong solvents and strong acids. Not good for biological materials. So how can you do micropatterning of biological molecules? And that's what the next chapter is about. So one of the very popular methods is by using microstamping. You make a PDMS stamp, right? So this, uh, this stamp you can make using soft lithography as we showed. So it has a relief pattern on there. And just like the rubber stamps that you can buy, you know, if you've ever seen the, the rubber stamps that can, for, for stickers and so on, if you want to stamp it, you, you dip it into the, the ink, and then the, the ink soaps sponge, and then you stamp it, right? The same idea with the PDMS stamp, okay? Except, you know, as we showed with soft lithography, you can make very small features on the PDMS stamp. 
Okay, you can get very, very small features even down into the tens of nanometers. Because this, this stamp, this stamp was originally made from photolithography. All right? You can define very small features in there. Another way you could pattern proteins is by um, uh, taking this stamp, sealing it temporarily to the substrate just by applying some pressure to it, and then flow the, a solution of proteins through, uh, through the channels. The proteins will adsorb to the surface here. So we'll talk more about that in the next chapter. And then you remove the microchannels. So that's another easy way you can protein uh, materials. So when we, when we say the word soft lithography, it refers to this replica molding process often. And it also refers to techniques that you can do with the stamp once it's been made. So this slide shows how, um, you know, how fine a resolution you can do. Uh, this shows the uh, uh, process. I'll, I'll go over it again, just because we have a nice diagram here. The first step is that you'd have a substrate and you deposit SU8 on it. SU8 is that photoresist. You photolithographically define that resist, so you develop certain areas away. You pour the PDMS over it, you cast it, and then you cure it, and then you remove the PDMS, and you're left with a stamp. This stamp is what you'll then use. For, um, you'll ink it with your proteins and then you'll just push it up against the surface and you'll essentially just deposit or stamp those proteins on the surface. Uh, now, the, the resolution of the technique is determined by the, the resolution of your PDMS stamp. If this PDMS stamp were to have 2 nanometer features on it, if there are 10 nanometer features, then in principle you should be able to ink 2 to 10 nanometer patterns of protein. So, <clears throat> where was I going with that? So, one of the ways that you can make the patterns much smaller is instead of traditional photolithography, you can use e-beam lithography. We talked about that in uh, two lectures earlier. If uh, e-beam lithography can be used to pattern your photoresist into much finer features. And then on top of there, you can spin coat um, what's called HPDMS, which is a hardened PDMS, so it's less, uh, less buckling, and then you cast regular PDMS on top of that, just as a carrier. So this, is, this stamp is made up of two layers of PDMS, a hard layer at the bottom and a softer layer on the top. The, hard, the hardened PDMS is, is more rigid, it doesn't bend as much, so it, it allows you to more faithfully reproduce very small patterns. In this case, they were doing sub 500 nanometer features here. You can see in this diagram here. And we'll go over this one really quickly. You can also use flat stamps too. Uh, if you want to take um, a PDMS stamp which has a relief pattern on it, uh, deposit ink on the top of it you can take a flat piece of PDMS or other material and ink and transfer the ink to the flat stamp like you see here flat chemically patterned stamp and then take that stamp and then transfer it to the substrate All right, this is if you want to just be able to preserve your PDMS stamp and you want to use an intermediate flat stamp to do the, the transfer these are examples of uh, proteins that were deposited using microcontact printing. These proteins were fluorescent, so everywhere you see the bright line here, that's where the protein was deposited. And you can see that you can get very fine features of uh, proteins on here. You can also use hydrogels. This is another creative way of using uh, micro stamps. Now, I mentioned here, in this slide we talked, we said that one of the properties of PDMS is that it's hydrophobic. Hydrophobic means it's water repelling. So one of the challenges sometimes with, with PDMS is that if, if this is water repelling, it's hard to get aqueous inks on there. The inks won't want to stick to the PDMS. Now, once 
uh, once the ink is there, that's a good thing. Uh, the the hydrophobicity is a good thing because if you were to take, if you were to deposit the ink on a hydrophobic stamp and you were to push that stamp up against a hydrophilic surface, if you were to take that ink, inked PDMS and push it up against glass, glass is hydrophilic, so that ink will transfer to the glass layer and it'll stay on the glass rather than staying on the PDMS. That being said, sometimes the hydrophobic nature of PDMS makes, um, um, makes uh, a microcontact printing a bit of a challenge. So uh, uh, this is an example of a micro stamp that's made from a hydrogel. A hydrogel is a hydrophilic material that, that absorbs water like a sponge. Okay, you can use the same replica molding techniques that I showed you earlier. Pour, pour the hydrogel over um, an SU8 layer, and you can get this pattern on your hydrogel. So like the hydrogel, again, it's, it's a, it acts like a sponge. It absorbs water. It also absorbs cells and molecular solutions. So th this, uh, an example is that they actually used a hydrogel stamp to ink bacterial colonies. You can take this stamp and dip it into a solution of, a, of, of containing bacteria, and then you can stamp out patterns of bacterial colonies on a substrate. That's very useful when you're trying to do high throughput studies of uh, the different colonies and how um, each of the colonies interacts with, how the bacteria within the colony interact with each other. Another example is if, um, if this stamp contains an etchant, you could take a foil of copper and just stamp the etchant onto that foil, and wherever you stamp, the copper will actually get etched away. So this was an example of, of this was an example of how you could just pattern a copper foil by this microcontact printing. Basically, they had this hydrogel stamp made up of a material called agarose. First, they inked the stamp, so they, the, the stamp absorbed all the copper etchant. Copper etchant is a, is a fairly common type of, uh, it, it's an etchant material that you can buy um, for, uh, for um, patterning uh, printed circuit boards, readily available. And then uh, you put the uh, copper foil on, uh, on top of the agarose like this. Or you, you know, the agros has the uh, um, the etchant in it, and you can basically transfer the patterns of the stamp onto the uh, onto a copper foil. Pretty interesting. So there's uh, there's many ways that you can use microfabrication techniques to make you know make small structures, and you can transfer those structures to a wide variety of materials. Okay. <laughs> This is another example, but I think just in the interest of time, we're going to skip over this. This, this shows how you can um, use microcontact printing to actually make a tube, um, a tubular structure where um, you have uh, copper foil wrapped around, microscale copper foil wrapped around a, a glass tube. That was, that was pretty interesting. Let's talk a little bit about microfluidic patterning. So again, the idea here is... Uh, that um, you can flow a liquid solution through a microchannel and then remove the microchannel. So wherever the liquid flowed through the channel, you'd end up with a surface pattern. So there's a, a, a famous paper that was published in 1997 where they showed uh, what you could do with this. So we were talking about that uh, um, a lot of times like biologists are interested in patterning proteins on a surface. You want to pattern um, one type of protein here and another type of protein right next to it. When you have pa patterned layers of proteins on a surface, uh, for example, if those proteins were cell attachment molecules, the cells will preferentially migrate along certain types of proteins. They will avoid other types of proteins. So there's, a, there's an interesting biology you can do if you can engineer the surface of, uh, of a device. This famous paper um, uh, showed that you could uh, pattern um, immunoglobulins. It's, a, it's an immune uh, uh, proteins that are part of the immune system uh, using these uh, microfluidic networks. Uh, 
So in this example, they had two channels here that were running parallel to each other. So they fabricated uh, two parallel microfluidic channels, and they flowed protein A into one microchannel, and they flowed protein B into the second microchannel. And then, um, then they basically removed the microfluidic channel, and they left the pattern proteins on the surface. And this shows... Um, uh, this shows a f uh, fluorescent image. So what they did was after they deposited these uh, uh, proteins on the surface, then they put a solution of antibodies on top, which were tagged with red or uh, green fluorescent, uh, fluorescent dye to show where those antibodies attached to the surface. So this is the reason why this paper was very popular back in the 1997 is that it was showing, you know, at, in 1997 a lot of these techniques were um, these techniques for um, patterning cells and proteins were not did not exist at that time. This is one of the early works that showed that oh you can use microfluidics to actually pattern uh, biological molecules on a substrate on a surface in a relatively robust manner. Another way you could do this is by using PDMS stencils. Uh, a thin membrane with holes can be used as a mask for depositing proteins and cells. We'll get more into this in the next module. But I just wanted to talk about how you could actually make the stencil here. Uh, so it's done in the same way as I showed you earlier. You have uh, some type of mold here. Okay. Uh, this would these little gray posts would be SU8 that photoresist. So this is the mold. You pour the PDMS over it. The only difference that you do here is that you press you press the PDMS down. You take a piece of glass on top of it and you press the PDMS down so that um, so in this step here, we poured a layer of PDMS on top of the mold. So this was the um, this was the SU8. We poured PDMS on top of there, and we just allowed it to cure. All right, that made just this blue structure that you see up at the top. If you were to press down, if you were to take a just a piece of glass here and just while the liquid while the before the PDMS is cured, if you just take some type of surface and you push down hard enough then instead of getting this thick layer of PDMS, you'll get just a thin layer of PDMS. It'll just look like this. It'll just look like this. Now what'll happen, when the PDMS cures, the regions where you had the SU8, there's going to be a hole in the PDMS. It's going to be a thin membrane of PDMS with holes in it. So that's, how you, that's what a PDMS stencil is. Right, this is an example of what you can make with that. It turns out stencils are, uh, are nice for patterning proteins also. If you, if you take a, the stencil and just put it up on, on a piece of glass, and then you pour the proteins everywhere, the proteins will only go through regions where there were holes. So you can pattern the proteins that way as well. So that's uh, PDMS uh, stencils. Now, um, going back to this, so in this example of microfluidic patterning, we flowed liquid through the microchannel, in the sense we flowed proteins through there, and the proteins themselves deposited themselves on the surface. Now, this is through a mechanism. It could be physiosorption. It could be chemical, uh, chemical absorption. We'll talk more about that in the next module. There's some chemistry involved there. But another thing you could do is, let's suppose you filled the microchannels with... Um, with a liquid, and that liquid is curable. It's meaning it's, it's, it can be cured in the presence of ultraviolet light. So if you flow liquid into a microchannel that has a certain shape, and then you subject it to ultraviolet light, it will harden inside the microchannel into whatever shape the microchannel has. That is called micromolding in capillaries. And they call it mimic for short. So what they did, again, they had the microfluidic channel, they flowed liquids through there, and those liquids were, um, 
UV polymerizable materials. Once a channel is filled, you expose the entire uh, um, uh, channel to ultraviolet light. PDMS is transparent down to about 300 nanometers, so it is transparent to ultraviolet light. And the ultraviolet light polymerizes these materials. It hardens them. It cures them. So you can make nice structures like this. You can make um, uh, sheet structures. You can even make multi-layer structures. If you take these sheet type structures and you stack them on top of each other, you can make um, uh, these types of uh, multi-layer structures. Or if you had a multi-layer microfluidic channel network, multiple layers of microfluidic channels, then you could also uh, do, this type of, uh, do this type of thing. Some of the advantages is that it's a relatively inexpensive process to do. The channels, the, the microfluidic channels can be reused. You can make complex multi-layer structures. Some of the disadvantages is that the patterns um, have to be connected with one another because you're only flowing liquid once through the channel. In order for the liquid to fill all the microfluidic channels, all the channels must be interconnected with one another. So there's some, just you have to set up your lab so that you can have the pressure sources to fill the channels. Um, you have to be careful that the material doesn't stick to the channel walls and, and a few other things here. Okay, well this is a nice, uh, uh, nice in, in it, relatively inexpensive process for making structures. Flow liquids into a channel and just uh, polymerize them in situ. Uh, a cooler version of this is what's called stop flow lithography. Uh, this was a lot of this work was done by Patrick Doyle's group at MIT, and uh, it's it is very interesting um, interesting way to make uh, uh, customized particles. Now um, there are uh, uh, many applications where you might want to have custom particles of specific shapes, specific sizes. Um, it's easy to make those particles in a large scale. You can use like 3D printing and so on to do that. But if you want to make those part, those objects very, very small and still have like well-defined features, then um, it's harder to do that. So um, he came up with this process called stop flow lithography, which uses microfluidics and it, ultra use, it, it uses ultraviolet light to create these very small particles. The way that it works, it's kind of cool. It's like a um, microfluidic assembly line. Uh, I think this, this one describes it well. So uh, we can look at this diagram here. So let's say you have, let's say you have fluid flowing through a microfluidic channel. All right. So this is a PDMS channel shown in blue here. And you have some liquid flowing through there. And then um, just like the multi, uh, the micromolding and capillaries approach, you, you will um, expose some of that liquid to ultraviolet light. When it's exposed to ultraviolet light, that material, that liquid will harden into a solid. That's what's happening here. So you have ultraviolet light here. And then it's hardening into a structure. Now, that's the same idea as micromolding and capillaries. But what, uh, what uh, Doyle's group did was just kind of interesting is that they patterned the light into a specific shape. So they were not polymerizing everything in the channel. They were only polymerizing a certain shape inside the channel. Right? For example, if they want to make the shape of, of a heart or a heart-shaped um, object, then they would project, um, they had a digital micromirror device, which can basically project light patterns. You guys have learned about that already. And the digital micromirror device was projecting a light pattern of ultraviolet light. And that ultraviolet light goes through a microscope objective. So the, this is the light pattern, patterned light, goes through the microscope objective and it's focused down into a small area. So whatever image was generated by the digital micromirror device was shrunk down by the objective lens, and um, that pattern was uh, polymerized the liquid inside the channel. So with the digital micromirror device, you know, like you can c connect a computer to it and generate any type of shape or image that you want, right? So you can project any arbitrary pattern of light into this microfluidic device and therefore get any arbitrary shape. 
And in fact, that's what they showed. You could get circular objects, square objects, uh, triangular objects. They, they made, you know, you can make any shape object you want. You can make letters. So this example here, they actually made particles that had um, all the letters of the alphabet. Okay, it would be very difficult to make these type of um, uh, custom particles um, with, well, you can make them using traditional photolithography, but it's, it's more expensive. So this is really a, um, an assembly line method of making particles. So they call it stop flow lithography because you have an inlet, you have a microchannel, you have liquid flowing in into the microchannel, and then you have this uh, polymerization region, light source, objective. So somewhere in the microfluidic channel, the uh, ultraviolet light is being focused, and in that region, the particles are being formed. So you flow some liquid into the channel, you stop the flow, and then you uh, turn on your ultraviolet light, you polymerize one particle. And then again, you turn on the flow, that particle is pushed forward, and then you stop the flow again, you make the next particle. So it's like an assembly line. So this paper, they were sort of showing that, um, you know, you could um, make a bunch of particles and sort of stack them up into different structures. But I think the real uh, interesting part about this is just the fact that you can just make arbitrary shapes and particles just one at a time inside a microfluidic channel. Now, this particular microfluidic channel had like a, 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 um, a recessed structure at the top, so these particles also end up having a recessed structure at the top. And they showed that you can make all sorts of like custom, custom sized particles. This is a really a neat, uh, neat process. So inside the microfluidic channel, they were flowing a material called PEGDA uh, with 2% Erga Cure photo initiator. A photo initiator is something, it's a, it's a chemical that when you add it to uh, a polymer material and you add ultraviolet light to it, it's a, it's a curing agent. You add the photo initiator and that makes the material sensitive to ultraviolet light. When you shine the ultraviolet light there, it will, it will harden and polymerize. This is another slide on, on stop flow lithography showing the lock and release technique. Um, the crux of it is right here. So here they use ultraviolet light to um, make two um, make two particles next to each other, and there was a, f a feature in the microfluidic channel that that kept those particles in place, and when you apply pressure to the channel, uh, this moves up and it releases the two particles. So um, they were able to make more complex particles using this lock and and release technique. It allows you to add multiple layers of chemistry to the same object. So that was a very creative way to do um, a customized lithography making particles. We talked about other 2D lithographic approaches, but as some of the limitations here of uh, 2D lithography, all the techniques we've talked about, or most of them we've talked about, whether we're talking about replica molding, soft lithography, traditional micromachining, traditional photolithography, they're, they're mainly 2D techniques. So you have a two-dimensional pattern that's defined by a mask. Um, and, and so you end up getting essentially two-dimensional structures. You can make three-dimensional structures by stacking layers together, but that gets more complicated. So um, there are some limitations of the lithographic approaches. So that lends itself to some of the 3D approaches. So how do we make true three-dimensional structures? We talked about some of these things before. Um, we talked about like 3D microfluidics via stereolithography, and we talked about 3D printed microfluidics. So I'm not going to go over those again. But the reason those techniques emerged, or why they've come about, is because there was an interest in, in, in creating truly three-dimensional structures. Okay, there are some other examples here. Um, we can make channels of varying height using something called grayscale lithography. Um, the way this works, again, it uses microfluidics. Um, in three microfluidic channels here, you flow a dye through them. And the dye has different levels of, the dyes have different concentrations. The thing about the dyes is that they absorb some of the ultraviolet radiation. So when you expose, 
the photoresist layer, the, the blue photoresist layer here, when you expose it to ultraviolet light, these microfluidic channel layers are really what are acting as a mask. And because the dyes have different concentration, they allow different amounts of ultraviolet light to pass through. And so you end up having, after you develop the photoresist, you have different thicknesses of photoresist. All right, so this really isn't, this isn't three-dimensional lithography, but at least you're getting channels of varying heights using this, what's called grayscale lithography. Grayscale lithography is where you're varying, varying the amount, varying the dose of ultraviolet radiation in different parts of the photoresist. And this can give you structures of varying heights. You can also do channels of varying heights using pneumatically actuated uh, replica molds. Uh, so in this example, you, you have these structures here. I, I shouldn't go into too much of the details here. We're going to talk more about um, um, deformable membranes and pressure-driven channels later on. I just want to point out that if, if you have a membrane which can deform, and uh, the different membranes deform by different amounts, and you pour a layer of PDMS over it, you can end up getting different uh, structures, different um, uh, heights of structures here um, depending on how much the membrane deformed. So PDMS will basically take the shape of whatever you pour it on, is the point I'm trying to make here. And so if the mold has varying heights, the PDMS will then also have varying heights. And um, just two more slides here. We talked about stereolithography, 3D printed microfluidics. Another completely different way of um, creating three-dimensional structures, which is, is very innovative, actually very interesting, and, and it's, it's what's called biomimetic. It, it mimics nature, is this approach of uh, self-assembly. Um, if you want to make a three-dimensional object using Legos, right, you take these small blocks of Legos and you basically connect them together, right? That's how a kid would make a 3D structure. Um, the way that um, the the way that this this was proposed by uh, George Whiteside's group is by using what's called self-assembly. You have small particles, small building blocks that can be connected together to form three-dimensional structures. The elegant thing about this was that they used what's called self-assembly. There's nothing that's actually putting the pieces together. The, the pieces are actually assembling on their own. And that's the really beautiful part about this. Now, in, in nature, self-assembly happens all the time. And we'll talk more about that in the next chapters. This is a segue into the next module. Um, for example, in nature, if you have a positively charged ion and a negatively charged surface, that positively charged ion is going to go to the negatively charged surface and stick there, right? If, in that case, like the, the chemical molecule... If you think about the chemical molecule as a building block, that building block just found um, a complementary, the, the piece that it's supposed to stick to, right? So in nature, like molecules are self-assembling all the time because electrostatic forces are very significant, you know, compared to the size of the molecule. All right. So at the mesoscale, at the millimeter length scale, uh, capillary forces are pretty significant. We were talking about the scaling of forces, right? So if you had particles, if you, if you created particles that have defined features, so for example, um, this particle has a, a pattern of solder on it, solder like a liquid metal, right? Um, and th those solder patterns are defined in specific regions of the object. You have one type of particle here. You have another type of particle where the solder patterns are defined on the edges of the cube. You have another particle where they're on the edges of a tetrahedron, and, and here they're just on the corners of the cube. Now, if you take those, if you were able to first make those objects, and then you put them in uh, a heated bath, when you put them in the heated bath, the solder melts just a little bit. And these regions where there's solder are going to attach to other regions where there's solder, because due to, due to a phenomenon called capillarity. And solder patterns will find the other solder patterns. 
So depending on what kind of patterns these particles have on them, they will actually self-assemble into larger scale structures. Those solder patterns will basically find each other when they're in this flask and you're just stirring around the flask. And the flask is heated to melt, melt the solder just a little bit. So this is, it's inspired by nature, but the, the idea behind this is to show, it's to show a philosophy. The philosophy is that you could actually get structures to form three-dimensional uh, aggregates on their own through a process called self-assembly. Right. So I think in, in one demonstration, they actually, um, they actually self-assembled LEDs on a, uh, on, a, on a circuit board so that you know, assembling circuit boards is pretty difficult. Um, it, it requires machines that pick up one piece here and literally puts them here. If you, when you're, you're dealing with really small objects, that becomes a problem. So um, if you had a way of doing where particles would automatically find themselves where they're supposed to go, um, that, that can be very, um, very useful. So um, this was some initial work done by uh, George Whiteside's group. There's a faculty at the University of Washington who does uh, some interesting work. Carl Boringer, he does work on uh, the assembly of particles on substrates. They tell this piece to find, to register itself in one location and, and self-assemble there. It's pretty cool, um, but we don't have time to talk much about that right now. Um, since we're at the end of class, I just want to summarize the main points uh, from this module. So the first thing we talked about was lithography. That's the patterning of materials via light. So uh, lithography can be applied to photoresists and other photosensitive materials. We talked about a few different types of photoresists, the standard ones, then there's the, sh the SU-8. We talked about... Um, other photosensitive materials that, are, that can be patterned using stereolithography. We talked about three-dimensional stereolithography. Um, the, after that, we talked about traditional micromachining techniques. If you make a pattern with lithography, how can you transfer that pattern onto a, um, a thin film material underneath it? So under traditional mi micromachining techniques, we talked about thin film deposition and thin film etching techniques. This is well suited for hard materials like silicon glass and thin metal films. So these are traditional semiconductor materials. These, are, these techniques emerged out of the semiconductor or microelectronics industry. The, today we talked about um, soft lithography, micromolding, stereolithography, microembossing, microinjection molding. These techniques have come out of, um, really have been inspired by just the, the plastics industry. The, the, the techniques that we use to uh, pattern plastics, and make these um, make plastic parts, which are much less expensive than silicon or glass parts. Uh, you can use some of those techniques to make small uh, object, small materials too. Then the soft lithography and the PDMS processes; those some of those processes are were really designed for uh, micro and nanoscale structures. And you can get very very tiny and fine structures with uh, things like micro contact printing, replica molding, and so on. And um, the last point is that a lot of these fabrication techniques are 2.5D. 2D would be just a two-dimensional surface. 2.5D is that you have, means you have a two-dimensional pattern that's sort of extruded into the third dimension. All right. So that's why they call it 2.5D. And we talked about a few 3D techniques, like true three-dimensional techniques, like stereolithography and um, uh, 3D printing. So those things are emerging right now. Some of those techniques have limited spatial resolution um, and, uh, and limited speed. Um, the ones that do have very good spatial resolution are, are still costly. Um, and the fact is that a lot of these 3D techniques are building things serially. Each device is being built one device at a time. So that can slow things down as well. So these are just some, some, things, to talk, uh, some things to think about. Um, so this module is, is really giving you a spattering of a whole bunch of different fabrication techniques. A little bit of this, a little bit of this, a little bit of this. And that's really how, you know, it, it's good that you know these different fabrication techniques because when it comes to building a device, you can borrow ideas from these different techniques when you come up with your own uh, process to make it a device that you're interested in. So it's just to expose you to the different areas. So next module, we're going to go into... Um, uh, patterning cells and proteins. We'll start on that on Monday. Uh, that module will involve some chemistry, but just a fair warning. Um, but it's, it's an important uh, chapter related to biomems because a lot of times with bio, 
uh, BioMEMS devices, we are patterning cells and proteins uh, on a surface, and we're, we need to engineer the surface properties of the, uh, of the device that we're working with. All right. So we'll probably spend um, one to one and a half lectures on um, surf engineering surface properties. And then we'll go on to um, the physics of microfluidics, how you can make pumps and valves and things like that. Okay. So uh, uh, next Tuesday, uh, let's plan on turning in the assignments. If you find that you need extra time and just need an extra couple days, let me know. That's, that's okay, too. I'm, I'm okay with pushing back the deadline a couple days. So just uh, let me know if, if you'd like to. But I'd prefer that if you can have it done by Tuesday, that'll be good. So any, any questions? Just Monday? Yeah. Monday, sorry. Sorry, I have another class Tuesday, Thursday, so. <laughs> yeah, Monday. So I'll see you all next uh, next Monday, then. Just <clears throat> email you, or? I'm sorry? Just email you the assignment, or how do you want to? Oh, just if you can turn in the assignment, just bring in hard copies okay. to class, that would be best. Yeah, that, that would be the easiest way.